TV. Tonight at 7 Mountain, it's an all-new episode of Studio C. Have a delightful evening with the family as you sit back with the pack and enjoy a good laugh. Then, tomorrow at 5 Mountain, get the latest updates and analysis of BYU football with host Dave McCann on a new episode of After Further Review. Watch your favorite BYU TV shows here and catch up anytime on BYUtv.org or the BYU TV app. This is like legitimately uplifting. I mean, I think we're really good to go for tomorrow. Yeah. All we have to do is get a piano and a piano cake and a small orchestra mm -hmm. in a tiny room. In under 10 minutes. Under 10 minutes. And quietly. Yeah. Piece of cake. around for family movie nights on BYU TV. When a successful lawyer gets in trouble with the law, he is sentenced to coach a losing hockey team for community service. But he quickly finds purpose as he inspires his ragtag team to win in the Mighty Ducks. Grab the popcorn and hit the lights for family movie nights all this month on BYU TV. You're watching BYU TV on KBYU DT Provo Salt Lake City. Hello, Cougar Nation. On this Monday, October 8th, we welcome you back inside the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. BYU has followed back-to-back -back wins with back-to-back -back setbacks. The latest, a 45-20 loss to Utah State at Lavelle Bridge Stadium on Friday, a game in which the Cougars fell behind 21-0 in the first half for a second straight week and could not recover. We're talking about it today with Defensive Coordinator Elisa Tuiaki and Offensive Coordinator Jeff Grimes, Coach Tuiaki in half hour number one, and Coach Grimes joining us in the back half of the show. Good to have you with us today on BYU TV and BYU Radio, Sirius XM 143, and now on 107.9 FM in Northern Utah, plus BYU Football's Facebook Live and ESPN 960. We're also live and on demand at BYURadio.org and BYUtv.org, plus the BYU TV and the BYU Radio apps. And we are taking your questions for the coaches right now on Twitter with the hashtag CCBYU or via comments on the BYU Football Facebook Live page. And we open today's show with defensive coordinator Elisa Tuiaki. Uh, Coach Tuiaki, another rough night for the Cougs. Uh, no takeaways on this night and 45 points allowed on defense, the most allowed in a loss uh, during the Kalani Satake era. You were asked during the week about uh, uh, controlling Utah State, uh, their high-powered offense, and you're only half-joking when you said score a lot of points. That's part of it uh, when you're playing Utah State. What was the game plan coming in, and where did the defense do adequately, and where be maybe where did they fall short? Yeah, the game plan was to really keep everything in front of us, and you know, um, limit the big plays. And and uh, we went back and watched it. Uh, the big plays really is what killed us, and it was uh, every every scoring drive there was a big play. <clears throat> the reverse, uh, you know, the the pop pass in there in one of their formations that they gave us, as well as just one run. And just it was just a basic one back power run, and um, you know. Uh, I think the story of the night was really just missed tackles and guys, uh, you know, playing hard and running to the ball, but just not getting the job done. And, and uh, you know, that all comes back on us as coaches. We've got to try to find a way to uh, put these kids in position to, to, to make plays and win, and we didn't. It seems like it becomes almost uh, uh, kind of a spiral with both drop balls and missed tackles. You see one or two, and then you see five or six all of a sudden, it seems. Yeah, yeah, and that's, you know, it's it hasn't really been something that uh, – um, I mean, you, you're always going to have missed tackles on defense, but this many, um, especially by some of the kids that normally don't do it, we back-to-back uh, um, -back weeks has been, has been bad for us against uh, Washington as well as Utah State, and and we've got to be better, we've got to be better tacklers, and we've uh, we've got to eliminate the big plays, and that's really what killed us and kept drives alive for them, and um, you know, the, credit them for some of the, the the stuff that they threw at us, some some things that you normally don't see in a in a shorter week, um, you know, where they had pre preparation, there were a couple of things that we saw, but what really wasn't what killed us. What killed us was just missed tackles and not sound football. Beyond the missed tackles, what's the overall vibe you got when you went back and watched it again, and then maybe compared it to some of your other games? Uh, you know, the the I think the the first uh, initial reaction, just as a, you know, as a coach, when I'm sitting on the sideline watching it, um, trying to figure out what uh, what we could be doing better or maybe changing things up from from what it was before 
And I went back, you know, to all the games this year and just looked at maybe some of the calls that we've made or situations that we've been in in certain calls. And really, um, I think if we would have won 45 to 48, it might might not have done the same thing. But as I go back and look at it, it's really um, we're doing we're doing a lot of this, the same things that we've done in games that we've won. Um, it's just we're not executing to the level that we need to be executing it at, and and I think that's that's been the biggest problem and we have, as coaches have to try to fix that did you guys play as physical a game as you needed them to on uh, on friday I don't, feel? you know i don't i don't i don't think so um you know i think think going back to the washington game as well as this one i don't think we're as physical as we should we need to be um you know i think we g- we're giving up too much in the run and you know a lot of it is uh, all starts up front you know with the d-line we got to do a better job with just plugging things up but also we've got to make tackles when we have the opportunity and I just don't think that we're doing that right now and so we've got to change things up at practice you know whether whether we're um, changing things up with the way that we practice or calls that we make or whatever it is but we've got to we've got to get guys in position and we've got to be able to to uh, eliminate all the mistakes that we're making and just and just uh you know, make tackles. <laughs> in the opponent's throw game right now, uh, BYU's tied for 118th nationally in sacks per game. Last year was 115th. In your first year, BYU's a lot better, 53rd, uh, upper half of the country at about two and a quarter sacks per game. Pressure on the QB has been harder to get over the last two years. What do you kind of put your finger on? Yeah, that? you know, that, that's another thing that I go back and look at, um, you know, this game as well as last game. And, um, you know, in in the middle of the game, it's always – you always get the feeling that you're not you're not creating enough pass rush. You're not getting enough. Uh, you're not getting enough uh, disruption to the quarterback. And I went back and watched this game, and the you know I think they threw 29 times. I believe it was. Uh, there were six legitimate times that we had to rush the quarterback. Because other times it's the ball's out in three step, or it's a RP, you know run pass option and the ball's out. And you don't really count those as, as opportunities to rush the passer. But we had six opportunities, and and we didn't come up with any. Um, but you know we had a we had a hurry and we had we forced two two dump offs to the running backs, which is where you want the ball to go in a pass. And and uh, you know uh, other times we just didn't get it. We didn't get it done. And so we've got to do a better job with the opportunities that we get. I don't think that we're getting as many opportunities that we have in the past. You know, especially when you when you get down early and you're starting to see see uh, uh, offenses control the ball more and more careful with the ball and doing a good job taking care of it. You're not going to get those opportunities and. Um, you know, several years ago when we had opportunity to, we, we you know, Galani and I were at, uh, um, you know, at Utah and, and led the country in sacks. It was mm-hmm. a lot of close games, a lot of games where we were up and uh, a lot of opportunities to pass rush, and the kids did a really good job. And I think right now we, we need to do a better job with, with uh, maximizing our, our, our uh, you know, opportunities. It's just... In those six times that I looked at, we need we need to come up with one, you know, and and uh, you might not with the other ones because the ball's getting out, but mm-hmm. it's just the nature of the game right now with where it's at. We've talked blitz percentage in the past. What's uh, kind of in the window for you in terms of what might be a normal game, and and when do you decide, and how do you decide to amp it up? Uh, I think more situationally, you know, you always go, go in with it, with a game plan as far as just having it on the menu, but um, filling it during the game, whether or not you think it's the right thing to do. And, you know, this last game we were like, well, nothing's working. Let's just, you know, do it. And it didn't work. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, it, it all just kind of from game to game just depends on how we're feeling and what we think and whether or not we feel feel like we're keeping the ball in front of us, whether or not we think, you know, we think uh, it's it's always risk reward, right? You You come away with two sacks. You know, if you blitz ten times and you end up giving up a touchdown, I don't think it's worth it. I think that you, you know, it, it just really depends on, on on what you think is is uh, is is the the reward. Um, but uh, you know, obviously, the more people you blitz, the just the the less the lesser you'll be in coverage. And you know, as far as coverage and what we ended up giving up, I mean, you know, we gave up one big pass and it was on one of those plays where it was just the misalignment by a guy and just a guy not making the play and. Um, it was, you know, one step away from being a sack. If somebody would have been aligned correctly, then, you know, we would have been able to either get the sack or a pick. But, um, you know, we just we just have to be better. We have to coach the boys better to to uh, see things, to react, to get where they need to be, and and just uh, um, finish the takeaways and finish the sacks. You got your starting linebacker trio back uh, for the first time in a while. Zane Anderson did return, so you had Zane, Butch, and Sione back together. In that uh, in that linebacker core, how did Zane look in his first game back, and uh, can you kind of be stable there for a while now? Do you think? You know, Zane's uh, Zane's fighting and doing his best, um, and and he's still fighting through some 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 injuries, just being banged up, and um, you know, I don't I don't know what it's going to look like for the future for him. Mm. I think I don't think 
I don't think he's, you know, I don't, he's not the same as he was before. Obviously, when you're banged up, it's just not not the same. And, you know, he's a guy that played hard and had opportunity. And he, he did really well, but just, you know, he's a guy that normally doesn't miss tackles. And and this time he did, he missed a couple, you know. It's just, um, I don't, we need to get him back healthy. We need to get him back where he's 100% and feeling confident with throwing his body in and, uh, you know, without injuring himself. And it was good to get him back, but, uh, you know, not not on Zane form, at least as, as we know him to, to play and what he's been in the past for us. Might it be the kind of thing, since you have a bye week coming up after this week, that you give him a week off to give him that longer stretch to hopefully be ready for the stretch run? Or, or do you think he play him this week? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think we'll have to make that call as we go into practice today and just try to figure things out. But, um, you know, Hawaii is 6-1 and one right now, and, and uh, they, they throw the ball a lot. And uh, that's that's kind of Zane's forte too, is just you know being in windows and, and covering guys. And so we'll we'll see where he's at. This okay, week. heading into break on the coordinator's corner. When we come back, more from defensive coordinator Eli Tuiaki. If you have questions for the coach, fire away with hashtag CCBYU on Twitter. We're back with more right after this. Call it a path or way through. It can be arrow straight or have twists and turns. It's life's financial journey, and Mountain America Credit Union is here to guide you every step of the way. With timely advice and affordable products, this is your journey. Let's begin together. We're Mountain America, guiding you forward. A foundling hospital. A vow of friendship. A ruthless matron. Do what we say! And a self-willed girl with plans of her own. Don't miss the next episode of Heady Feather, Sunday at 6 Mountain on BYU TV. Everybody enjoys a little prank from time to time. Add a little magic to the prank, and things get even more interesting. What? That is insane. This season, I'm teaming up with families to prank siblings, friends, parents, and their kids. What? You're on TV right now. I'm Eric LeClaire, and it's time for a little mischief. This is why you brought me here? <laughs> Catch the all-new season on BYU TV, premiering tonight at 6.30 Mountain. Don't miss it. I'm Dave McCann. Tomorrow on After Further Review, we review Utah State and preview Hawaii. Best hour, BYU football on television. Blaine Fowler, David Nixon, Brian Logan explain the game tomorrow night here on BYU TV. Bruh, I ain't got no chill. The BYU TV Sports Countdown to Kickoff. BYU versus Hawaii. 9 Eastern, 7 Mountain, Saturday. Dinner after the game at JCW's includes something for everybody, from burgers to wings, shakes to salads. JCW's quality and a lot of it in Lehigh, American Fork, Provo, South Jordan, and coming soon to Harriman. BYU now 3-3 three and three after falling at home to Utah State this past Friday night. The first time the Aggies have beaten the Cougars in consecutive seasons since the early 1970s. Defensive coordinator Elisa Tuiaki with us to break it down and look ahead to Saturday's home game with Hawaii. You've been on the other side of the BYU-Utah State rivalry in the past. You know how big it is uh, for that school uh, in Logan, and you know how Utah State treats this game. It had been a while since Utah State had picked up, like I said, consecutive wins against BYU. Now they've done it. It seems like they kind of expected to do it based on what I've kind of heard afterward, and they were fired up from the get-go. You expected, you had to expect that, I would hope. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're... They're playing really good football, and, uh, you know, it's an in-state rivalry, and I, we expected them to come in and, and play hard, and they did, and um, they got the job done. You know, we just we, we needed to play harder. We need to play better. We need to do, do things better as far as just coaching the kids better and getting them right. We talked about uh, Zane Anderson's situation before the break. We'll see what happens with him. Uh, Diane Gonwoluk, who's now been out uh, for three weeks, so how much has his absence affected your team's ability to defend, and what might you think about him uh, prognosis-wise? Yeah, you know, any time that you're missing a good player, it's it's always always tough, and you know expect the backups to step up and and do a really good job. But we're definitely missing uh, some speed and athleticism when those with, when those two are not on the field. 
Okay. In terms of raw yards and yards per play, Utah State's performance on the offense was was uh, average, slightly above perhaps, but in fact uh, for them it was actually below average in terms of total yards. But at BYU had uh, more yards per play and only 27 fewer total yards on the day. But when you're minus 10 in field position and minus 3 in the turnover margin, that's going to make it hard to win, and that's what happened on, on Friday night. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's... I think, you know, the story of us just kind of shooting ourselves in the foot and, and not getting out of the hole, and um, we just have to be better. We have to come out, and we have to have the kids prepared right out the gate to come out firing. And, and uh, I mean, getting the crowd involved is a big deal when you're at home, and we just never, never, you know, gave the crowd an opportunity to really get the energy moving, and, and we have to do a better job of that. Were you close to takeaways at all at any part on Friday? Did you go back and look at it and say, we've got a play here or there to make, or were they just not there for you? Um, you know, I, I think, uh, the big play that they ended up having, I think was just, it, it could have been a pick or a sack was one of them. And then, you know, other than that, I think they just did a good job taking care of the ball and they just, you know, we ended up having one ball that jarred loose towards the, you know, at the goal line, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't anything that was going to be close to us picking up. You know. Uh, takeaways are those uh, I mean they're not totally random but some, again some it seems like some seasons BYU has more than others uh, and for the first few games this year I think you're probably okay in that respect uh, where have you been from a takeaway standpoint in terms of what you de- what you want your defense doing overall yeah we're not 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 where we need to be you know we always try to uh, the goal is to, is to get three right if you can get three takeaways and um, you're giving the ball back to our offense, our offense is taking care of the ball and, and going down and scoring off of those. And I think that you're running away with games. But um, we haven't we haven't had any of those takeaways, you know, in the last few weeks. And we have to do a better job with just getting those. We have to do a better job with um, really capitalizing on, on moments, on opportunities to do that. And, uh, you know, they're, they're not there as, as much um, when you're down and when teams are doing a good job protecting um, but they're there when they're close, and we just have to, you know, if we're we're moving the ball and we're we're uh, playing good defense, then those opportunities will be there more than they will be if you're playing, you know, basically four minute offense the whole time. And so, um, we just have to do a better job getting the ball. It's one of the old football adages, but it kind of holds true. You want to run it, and you want to stop the run. The Ags had 5.3 yards per rush for 223 on Friday. Uh, what's an acceptable uh, YPR for you uh, when you go in game to game? And does it vary by team? I mean, three, three is is you're you're playing pretty good run defense. Anything below that is really good, and you know you like to see some somewhere in the twos, 2.8 or something like that. Um, you know, the 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 reverse ended up popping big for us so so you know the way that we track our our big plays um you know passes past 20 and runs past 10 and we ended up giving up five five big plays in the run which is unacceptable we have to we have to do a better job and you know like we talked about before um you know attribute a lot of that to to maybe just missed tackles or guys drooping off of tackles and um we have to do a better job and the, the reverse wasn't anything special as far as the trick play it was just it was just, uh, you know, guys missing tackles or guys not doing their job, and we've got to coach them better for those guys to, to do their jobs better. Credit to their backs. They were good, and they and they, and they ran a bunch of them at you too. And we talked about this. We talked about this last week. I thought their backs were really good. I like their backs. I think both of them are really good players. Um, yeah, good good players, good backs, and they ran like it. Uh, on the play where they had the uh, the throwback uh, for the touchdown, uh, I think running back leaked left, right? Uh, was that by design, or I think was that a last gasp thing for a quarterback? It, it was by design. Yeah. It was by design because it looked like throwback to me, and like a pretty well executed throwback. But it was it was well executed. It was it was just one of those funky formations, and um, you know that that one really totally was on me as a coordinator, and we went in. Um, Went in thinking, you know, we, we've schemed certain things, and one of the one of the schemes that I put in had a check, and uh, we normally don't call it in the red zone, but felt to call it in this one, and they ended up checking to to it, and we hadn't practiced it. It was still sound, and there should have still been a guy there, but I mean, we came off to the sideline, and it was totally on me for that one for even calling it in the red zone. Um, if it would have worked, I would have looked like a genius, but <clears throat> it's just. Shouldn't have put the kids in that position where we haven't practiced something and and we ended up doing it at, at, in that moment. It just wasn't right for them, but uh, it was it was a trick, basically a sprint out, rollback, throwback. So. Yeah. Okay, uh, it's a bit of a rough patch right now. But who's maybe somebody on this defense, or even a couple of guys who aren't getting talked about a lot, or who may not maybe show up in the stats in a big time way that you think is quietly uh, doing a really nice job and doing what you need to get done defensively. You know, there's there's always a couple of D linemen that stick out because their names aren't aren't called very very often. Um, 
you know, we we missed Brack in this last game, and he had been doing a good job uh, previously in the in the first few games. But um, was he but was he banged up? He was he's banged up. Okay. He didn't play this last game. Yeah. Um, you know, Kyrus has, Kyrus has been good for us, um, doing a really really good job. Kyrus Thong as well as uh, I think Zach Daw. I mean, a lot of those defensive linemen that are rotating in there. Uh, Merrill Thalia Oli is doing a really good job, and um, you know, Corbin Corbin plays hard and and is always lights out and the way that he plays with effort and and. Uh, I think he's been really good, but Tanner Jacobson's another guy that I think has been quietly just kind of doing his thing and consistent and and really reliable and really, um, you know, besides besides uh, you know just some just some technical things, um, I I've, I've really been pleased with Chris Wilcox and the way that he's played, you know, and a lot of people they don't really they don't really you don't really track how many PBUs they have or you know how many times that quarterbacks look the way and don't throw, but. Mm. Um, you only track how many times they get burned, right? It's like, as a corner, you have to have a short memory. But Chris Wilcox is playing playing really well, and he's got to continue to play confidently in order for us to play good good defense. And um, you know, the, he ended up giving up a slant, was just playing with bad technique, really just kind of rolling back on his heels instead of playing like he normally does. But I think for for the most part, overall, he's been playing pretty pretty solid. Okay, before we head to break here, as you mentioned a bunch of D linemen, uh, is Wayne Tay Kirby still with you guys, and is he a part of your future? Wayne, Wayne is still with us. He's on the team uh, right now. Currently, he's <clears throat> he's been running with the scout team. Um, you know, when he he ended up coming to us from Oregon. He didn't play all the season at Oregon, and then when he came to us, he didn't he didn't practice in the spring. He ended up having an injury, and then he ended, didn't practice in fall camp because he ended up having an injury as well. And so, he's he really um, coming out of high school has only had half of a season without any off season. And so, right now, I think that he's going to end up being a good player. He's got a future, but uh, he's he's a ways away from beating some of the guys that are playing. And so, he's got 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 potential and doing a really good job. Um, so we shouldn't expect to see him on. this year, maybe then, right? Uh, I, I think that you could see him, um, yeah. but uh, he's he's got he's got a, a lot of football to learn, you know. And um, I think if we're in a different situation with different guys, you know, you definitely see him. But um, you know, to take reps away from the guys that are doing a really good job and giving it to him, I just don't think that we're at that at that point right now. But he's getting a lot of work and and uh, learning a lot on the scout team right now, going against the first offense. Okay. Yeah, well, thanks for the update because yep. I think he's somebody people had thought about, and maybe kind of forgotten about a little bit. Yeah. So appreciate yep. that. All right, coming up, uh, more with BYU defensive coordinator Eli Satuiaki and your questions for the coach using hashtag CCBYU. This is the coordinator's corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. Back with more right after this. I agree. AAA agents like Leticia are popping up where people are having doubts about insurance. Like when it comes time to buy a car. So how can I help you today? What if I decide to become a rideshare driver? If you want to outsmart insurance doubt, visit a AAA branch. We're changing how you receive health care. To give you more choices. To be more personal. Like seeing a doctor from your hotel room rather than a patient room or seeing your primary care physician when you normally couldn't. It's putting you first and also putting you more in control. It's care how, where, and when you want it. Intermountain Healthcare. Visit healingforlife.com. AAA agents like Octavia are popping up where people are having doubts about insurance. Like here, where Makai is learning to drive. What brings you in today? When I get my car, can my friends drive it as well? If you want to outsmart insurance doubt, visit a AAA branch. Hi there, how are you? My name's Todd. Nice to meet you. Hi, also. Can we put you on our TV show for a second? If any lesson can be learned from the story track. I felt misunderstood. I felt like there was no one in the world who was going through that thing. I hope people will understand that they're special. I'm a believer. They're important. I'm a believer. I got what they're saying my life. They have a compelling story. They are worth getting to know. Watch the story track tomorrow at 8 Mountain on BYU TV. Some say if you're looking for the soul of America, you'll find it right here in Memphis, Tennessee. But if Memphis is the soul of America, then what's the soul of Memphis? From the banks of the Mississippi to the neon lights of Beale Street, that soul's hiding somewhere, and I've got to put it all in one painting. Join me as we paint the town of Memphis, Tennessee. Don't miss Painting the Town tomorrow at 8.30 Mountain on BYU TV.
And you are in the coordinator's corner, brought to you by JCW's, the Burger Boys, BYU and Hawaii, coming up Saturday night at Lavelle Edwards Stadium. UH already one win away from becoming bowl eligible. They've already got six wins, they're six and one, but they play 13 games. They've got to finish seven and six to secure that immediate uh, postseason berth. Coach Tuiaki, Hawaii. Playing BYU, always a big deal for them, obviously. But they're playing also now for bowl eligibility, so no shortage of motivation on the other side. You've got to have your guys just kind of ready to match the other side's intensity, especially from the get-go here, it seems. Yeah, you know, we, we need to get back and just play our type of ball. We need to – we need to um, we've got to we've got to coach the boys to get – I mean, we need to come out the gate firing. We need to get the crowd into it. Um, you know, the, the, the crowd deserves to see better football, and the boys deserve to win. And regardless of who we're playing on the other side, and I'm sure they're going to come with with uh, passion, and they're going to want to get that that next win to become bowl eligible. But um, we just need to get back in form with the way that we play ball. You finished last season by beating Hawaii at their place, and they're off to a great start this year after a really rough patch <clears throat> last year. How different do they look? Because uh, a lot of changes were made uh, since the end of last season to get them uh, back to where they want to be. Uh, they they look really good on offense. You know, they're uh, they've got a lot of good skill players. Uh, they're really simple, but but uh, I, I, they they look a lot like Utah State. Not as probably not as uh, uh, run pass oriented, but look a lot like them as far as just being simple and being clean and um, everybody doing their job and the quarterback doing a really good job, just getting rid of the ball. And I mean, they're you know top top in the nation right now with quarterback as well as receivers. It's just you know I don't know if they're top three now with the quarterback not playing, but um, they they look really good. I think that they're they're being well coached right now. Their uh, receiver, John Rasua, is already at 13 touchdowns on the year, uh, 12 receiving and one rushing. He's pretty special. He's a good player, a good player. And he's got, you know, we we're, were actually watching it this morning and just trying to figure out which one he was. And um, you couldn't tell off of the get-off off the line because the other guy was just as fast. <laughs> so they, they've got good players, and, and they do a really good job with just executing their offense. Hawaii hung on to beat uh, Wyoming 17-13 on Saturday night in Honolulu. Uh, UH not really the same team we saw in the first six games because starting quarterback Cole McDonald uh, was out injured. McDonald's numbers are pretty impressive. So in the six games, he's thrown for 2,100. Uh, 24 touchdowns to two picks, passer rating around 170. But the new guy is a freshman who took his first snaps in Saturday's game. So if McDonald's out, they're not quite the juggernaut they've been, and a lot may depend on if they get the guy or not this weekend. Yeah, I think so. You know, the the, the new guy actually came in and threw a pick six, and that's how uh, Wyoming ended up scoring. And, um, you know, I think Wyoming did a good job just giving him different looks and making it harder for him to read things, and we've got we've to do the same. All right, uh, social media questions. Uh, this one coming in from at Royale underscore with cheese. What adjustments will be made to slow down uh, the Hawaii offense? And you had a good offense come in here last week with Utah State, and uh, they were putting up a ton of yards and points. UH similar. Again, starting quarterback makes a difference. But uh, what adjustments can you make to slow them down? You know, we. I think I think it uh, really just starts with us kind of, you know, getting on the same page with our boys. And, and uh, you know, as we talked as a staff, um, we, we've we've got to get them right. We've got to get them, you know, playing. We've got to get them passionate. We've got we've got to get them playing BYU football. And, and uh, these last two weeks, we haven't been doing that. You know, we kind of start starting, you know, decently, and then just kind of deflating ourselves and shooting ourselves in the foot. And that's just not like us. We've got to do be better with just being sound with our assignments. Everybody know what they're doing and run to the football. Kalani talks a lot about that. Just that phrase, playing BYU football again. To you, from your perspective, what are the characteristics of BYU football on defense? Sound and physical, um, you know, guys lined up right, guys doing their jobs correctly with correct technique, and guys playing physical. Um, I think when we're doing that, we're playing really good football on defense. You've played six games, but already so many uh, swings in emotion, highs to lows, uh, and you are sitting here at 3-3, three and three, still only three wins from bowl eligibility, a manageable task, certainly. Uh, how key is it that the guys, uh, again, remain with the eyes on the prize and realize that, that uh, goals you have to reach are still in front of you? It's, it's important, especially after back-to-back -back losses. You know, there's always a um, lot, lot of doubt, right? And people start saying things and people start writing things and, you know, questions start start coming up and being raised. And we have to understand that uh, our goals really are still in front of us to, to get accomplished in order for us to be, become bowl eligible. Um, I, but I think more important than that is just we, we just have to do this for ourselves. We have to get back in form and play the type of football that we know we can um, and our goals will fall in place. The Hawaii game, uh, the BYU game for Hawaii, we already know how much it means. Does it mean a lot to some of your guys, too, uh, taking on the team from the islands? Yeah, it's always uh, fun. You know, a lot of times you have relatives on the other side of the ball, and especially with a lot of the Polynesian kids that we have, it's 
um, you know, you say you're related and you find out you really are related. You know, there's a lot of relatives on the other side. And, um, and so we'll have, we'll have family from Hawaii coming here to watch us as well as some of our, you know, their family here in Utah, uh, here to watch them. And it'll be a fun game. Well, good luck against uh, the Rainbow Warriors on a Saturday night. Coach Tuiaki, thanks for coming in. Thank you. All right, that is Coach Elisa Tuiaki. Coming up after the break, I'll be joined by BYU Offensive Coordinator Jeff Grimes as we continue on the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys here on BYU TV and BYU Radio. No matter what stage you're at in life, you're always looking to take the next step forward. At Deseret First Credit Union, we want to take each and every next step with you. With low auto loan rates, you can be ready to see what's around every new corner. And amazing rates on home mortgages, so you can move up to something you've always dreamed of. Deseret First Credit Union, with you every financial step of the way. Membership and eligibility required. Equal housing lender. Discover something new this week with BYU TV. Tonight at 7 Mountain, it's an all-new episode of Studio C. Have a delightful evening with the family as you sit back with the pack and enjoy a good laugh. Then, tomorrow at 5 Mountain, get the latest updates and analysis of BYU football with host Dave McCann on a new episode of After Further Review. Watch your favorite BYU TV shows here and catch up anytime on BYUtv.org or the BYU TV app. Tomorrow on BYU Football with Kalani Sitake, the coach recaps the Utah State game, previews the matchup with Hawaii, and answers your questions using the hashtag Sitake Show. Watch BYU Football with Kalani Sitake tomorrow at 8 Eastern on BYU TV. Bruh, I got no chill. The BYU TV Sports Post Game. BYU versus Hawaii, Saturday after the game. I thought you said it was like a masterpiece. The scorpion stung me. It's like a masterpiece in the sense that it's not what. The poison. You're already dying. Oh, yeah. <sighs> Two for one style, bar baby. Woo! <laughs> Sir, I don't think this is going to work. Writers have to have a thick skin. Yes, I see you wrote that on page 20. Maybe try less bad cop, more good cop. Don't miss Studio C tonight at 7 Mountain on BYU TV. Dinner after the game at JCW's includes something for everybody from burgers to wings, shakes to salads, JCW's quality and a lot of it in Lehigh. American Fork, Provo, South Jordan, and coming soon to Harriman. We're into the back half of the coordinator's corner as we move from defense to offense. Welcoming in offensive coordinator Jeff Grimes. Your questions for Coach Grimes, welcome using the hashtag CCBYU or via comments on BYU Football Facebook Live. Coach Grimes, good to see you after your bye week with us, at least your week off. Yeah, good to yeah. see you, Greg. So uh, you have to get in rearview mirror mode pretty quickly, as you've uh, talked about in the past. We'll look back a little bit on Utah State for obvious reasons on this show. How long does it take you, generally speaking, positive or negative result, win or loss, to kind of throw it in behind and, and be fully immersed into the next week's task? Well, you kind of force yourself as a coach to move ahead of the players a little bit because we have to. We're already uh, obviously deep into game planning mode for the next game. However, uh, you kind of have to revert back for a little bit because you have – an afternoon meeting with the players on Monday and that's our opportunity to to address the game and watch the film with them and and learn from that experience and you you sort of have to do that before you can fully put it to rest and move forward. Let's start with the start uh, on Utah State, and, and BYU has uh, no first possession scores this season. And, and let's just maybe start there for a second. Our first possession scores a goal, something that you think is important for the offense? No, I think we should try to go out and not score. No, no, I mean, like I get, the first no, one from the game. No, I understand the question. I, mean, I just, I get asked that a lot. And it, and, um, you want to score in every possession. Obviously, you want to score in every possession, and we put a lot of thought into the plays that we run, um, not just our, our first possession, but about the first uh, 10 to 15 plays of the game. And for whatever reason, we're just not um, executing early. So we've got to maybe put a little thought into – we, we certainly do put a lot of thought into that and try to pick plays that we think our, our players are very comfortable with. We try to pick plays that we feel like we can block and our quarterback can get into a rhythm with. Um, 
it, it just didn't happen again for us, and that's our responsibility as, as coaches, and we got to do a better job with that. Question more focused on whether it's actually a goal of yours as as a benchmark you want to hit, or you just kind of let the first quarter or the game play out and you hope to score, you know, kind of thing. Is it because is it an important thing for you that way, or yeah? I, it, I think you got to be careful sometimes with with specific goals because if you say we have to go out and score on our first drive, if that doesn't happen, then it can have a deflating effect on your offense. And I think you have to try, and we're we're still a uh, work in progress on this to build in a resiliency that says whether we get stopped our first drive or our first three drives or our first five drives that we can still come out and have success. There's one thing we know about the Kalani Satake era. It's that the Cougars are excellent front runners. It's just getting out in front has been a little more difficult as BYU's been outscored a 38-7 in the first 15 minutes of this year. And it's the second straight week, Jeff, where you find yourself kind of in a bigger hole than you'd like, down 21 nothing in the first half in, in consecutive weeks. No coach ever anticipates that being the case. Is it a harder team to come back with because of the nature of the offense at this moment, bigger deficits? Yeah, I think so. I think um, we, have, we have shown that we have the ability to come back, and we've, we've, we've attempted to make rallies in a couple of games once we got down. Um, but we have not shown the big play ability uh, that so often helps you do that. It's it's a uh, it's a challenge to 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 score from a long way out. And we've um, when we when we scored even in this last game, we did it uh, by marching the field more methodically um, rather than having a big play that goes the distance. And yeah, that makes it harder. So the current mo is kind of run it, hang on to it, and uh, and it was tough against Utah State. Uh, Fifty four sack adjusted rough rush yards and. Bottom line is game script, game flow kind of dictated. It was not going to be uh, as, as run predominant a game when you got down big. Then there were the three giveaways, and minus three in the margin is always tough to, to overcome as well. So you put it on the ground a couple times. There's the pick six, and uh, when you go minus three margin and, and tough to run, it's going to, be a, it's going to be a battle, isn't it? Hard. Yeah, and, and we've never said that we were going to be a team that was going to be a predominant run team. We've always said, ever since I took this job, is that we'd be balanced and that we would be able to – run it more so than throw it when the game allowed for that and that we'd be able to pass it more when the game allowed for that. Um, but the f- position that we found our, ourselves in, which is a, an unenviable one, is where one where you feel like you have to throw it almost every play or you just stand no, no opportunity to catch up. And that's, that's certainly not the way we're built right now. Okay, so the first possession, first possession went by the wayside, but you get your second possession starting at the 48, and I'm sure at that point, when you start at the 48, you're expecting points and to take a lead right there, which would have been huge for BYU. Uh, the third and 10 play is kind of interesting on that drive because Micah, I think, gives back the sticks a little bit while trying to make a play. Is that how you kind of saw it? It seems like when he makes the catch, he's going to have the yard to gain, and I think he wants to extend it and go across the field, make a bigger play. I think, you got to, first of all, you got a bad spot on it, I thought, uh, where they spotted him. Um, How did you see that particular play? The same as you did when he caught the ball. He should have just, and, and he would be the first to say that. Micah has um, a great um, willingness to admit when um, he could have done something better, as most of our players do, but I'm sure he wishes he could have had that over again. Um, but in the effort to to make a play, um, uh, went a little bit more laterally than he should have. Yeah. And then, uh, so you get fourth and one. You came to the line right away. Then you called timeout. Was what was the cause of the timeout there on, on the fourth and one? Um, there, there was just um, a little miscommunication there, and um, someone wasn't aligned correctly, and so we just took an opportunity to get it, um, knowing that we still had plenty of, of time to get it to get it how we wanted it before we called the play. And we've been. 100% run this year in that situation mm-hmm. and really felt like um, the the right thing to do. And we talked about it as a staff leading into this game was the first opportunity we had in a short yarded situation is that we wanted to to take um, an opportunity to throw to throw a play action pass and um, didn't work out for us. So the pre timeout play and the post timeout play were the same play. I take it then. Correct. Yeah. What did Tanner see when he came back to the sideline in terms of how he, th- you know, it becomes the pick six, obviously. Um, did you see what he saw and what was kind of his, his thoughts to you when he came back? 
Yeah, I didn't really give him an opportunity. I just tried to encourage him, and and the guy made a great play on the ball, and and he knew already the mistake that he had made, and A-Rod had talked to him on the phone, and so I just tried to tell him, hey, that's one play. Let's move past it and go on to the next series, and, and he's he's been able to, to do a pretty good job with that, I think. All right, Coach Jeff Grimes is with us. We are taking a break on the coordinator's corner. When we come back, uh, more with the coach on what's ahead for BYU with Hawaii coming in on Saturday night. This is the coordinator's corner brought to you by JCWs. Stay with us. When my grandfather started this company in 1947, he couldn't have envisioned what we would ultimately become. We realized that our value to our customers is that we will be there day after day, year after year, doing whatever we need to to find solutions to the challenges that they face. We are committed to be honestly better in all that we do and every opportunity that we have to serve our customers. BYU football has always been an event. It's been part of our life that we we celebrate, and there's great buildup, and it's like a holiday in the McCann family. There are a lot of things that are difficult in life. This isn't one of them. It's always been a release, and I think that's what's great about sports. It's not life or death in sports. It's a release from the life and death things we deal with every day. That's why we're always here when they kick off again. Viewers can get involved by going to randomaxtv.com and nominating either people who need help in their lives or people who are a force of good in their community and just need a step up or something like that or the recognition that they are a good person. Sometimes you, that's all you really need is that recognition that you're a good person. You're a good person. Sorry, I just wanted to give you that recognition. Don't miss Random Acts tomorrow at 7 Mountain on BYU TV. A foundling hospital. A vow of friendship. A ruthless matron. self-willed girl with plans of her own. Don't miss the next episode of Heady Feather, Sunday at Six Mountain on BYU TV. Coordinator's Corner brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. BYU Offensive Coordinator Jeff Grimes with me till the top of the hour. 3-3 three and three BYU hosting 6-1 and one Hawaii on a Saturday night. Against Utah State, uh, BYU actually gained more yards per play by the end of the day. Uh, thanks in part to a final drive averaged 13 yards per play. And it was your most explosive drive of the season, uh, Jeff. And it was led by Zach Wilson. And that may not be a coincidence. He has the makeup of kind of a bigger play QB. And BYU's had just the three explosive drives in 72 possessions this year. But he did lead you down the field with a handful of uh, big plays, including 26-yard scamper, which was the longest run play of the day for BYU. When Zach came in, the game was lost, but it was BYU's final possession, and you could have wrote it out, I guess, uh, with Tanner, but you chose not to. Uh, your thoughts on the decision to bring in Zach and um, and what he gave you at the very, very end? Well, I just felt like at that opportunity, if nothing else, it'd be a good opportunity for Zach to get some playing time as well as um, kind of evaluate him in that moment. And so I, I asked Kalani about it, and he said, sure, go ahead. So we put him in, and, you know, sometimes it's, um, it's a little easier to come in to a game in that situation. I've seen it happen before with a backup quarterback, particularly a young guy who kind of has nothing to lose in that moment and, and do well. And I don't want to minimize what he did. I think he, I think he uh, did a great job and led us, on, led us on a scoring drive. And so I was certainly pleased that he did that. Um, but that is something different than doing it for an entire game and, and starting out the game that way. But we, we all know and have known since even before Zach stepped on campus that he is um, a talented player and the kind of guy who has playmaking ability. Uh, both with his feet and the ability to uh, to throw the deep ball, and so we have a lot of confidence in Zach, and and we'll continue to look forward to uh, to his growth and giving him new opportunities. He wasn't coming in to just hand off and get you to the end. He was coming in uh, to make plays, right? You were going to go throw him in there and say, "Go do your thing." Mm -hmm. Yeah, we wanted to give him an opportunity. There's really no. Um, 
function and putting him in at that point and having him hand the ball off. If we're going to put him in, let's let him have an opportunity for growth and, and let's use it as an opportunity to evaluate where he is for our team. I'm sure a lot of folks are curious if what he did at the end of the last game uh, puts him in a position to start your next game. It puts him in position to compete for that, for sure. And one of the things that we've said from the beginning is that um, we're going to play the guys that we feel like give us the best opportunity to win. And he certainly said something about his play in that moment. Um, And that position... Uh, Just like our left guard position where we played two guys the other night and just like um, our F receiver position when we're playing with 11 personnel, we could use a number of different people there. Each of those spots um, has the opportunity to play a number of people there. And so um, at this point, whether we we continue with Tanner or whether we, we play Zach early or whether we play Zach a little earlier in the game than we might, those um potential scenarios are all on the table at this point would you probably not do anything publicly relative to that position let it ride till till saturday do you think in terms of that spot probably okay starting quarterbacks a position um unlike say left guard or anything else it's 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 unlike a position on a football team anywhere else because it's the one spot where change most frequently has the most dramatic consequences and and Tanner's not responsible for missed tackles or drop balls certainly and he's uh and and yet quarterback seems to be a thing if you make a move there it can it can have pretty drastic swings in how your team performs how much weight do you put on that decision and how you know the kind of impact it might have on a team a great deal um and you know honestly tanner um didn't play great the other night but there are a lot of guys that didn't play great the other night and that's that's why we got our butts whipped severely by Utah State and and not to take anything away from them they're a good team and they're well coached and they they played really well um, but but we didn't play our game. We turned the football over. We had um, uh, a number of mistakes that just kept us from um, converting in particular on third down. One of nine is ridiculously bad. Um, and certainly Tanner had something to do with that, but he wasn't the only one, and, and really he wasn't any worse than some other guys either. Um, however, the offense has to produce, and it has to move the football consistently and score points, and and uh, that hasn't happened the last couple of weeks. Where's your offense performing adequately to you right now, or more than adequately? Um, Saturday night, nowhere did we did we um, meet expectations. Um, we didn't run the ball well. Um, we didn't um, throw and catch consistently enough. Um, our pass protection was better. Than it, than it has been in, uh, at a couple of other times. Um, but really, we um, we didn't play well enough in any facet of the game to to earn a victory. Is pass pro generally, though, giving your quarterback the time you need to, to make the plays you'd like to see him make? It is. There are times that I think go unnoticed that um, the pass pro is great, and then there are times that go unnoticed when it's not, and it might force the quarterback just to get off of his spot. And even though... We didn't get a sack. Um, I think one of the things that Tanner has done a good job of at times is throwing the football away and keeping us from getting sacks. So our sack number isn't very high, uh, but at times the quarterbacks had to to avoid pressure to make that happen. Back to to Zach just for a moment. Uh, Of course, one of his greatest gifts is the ability to either extend a play or make a play with his legs. What's the proper value to put on that component of his game that differs from, say, Tanner? Well, I think when you have a, a team like ours that that um, has not shown the ability to make big plays, I think that certainly uh, adds a little bit more weight to that part of his game. Yeah, and the explosive we've talked about before on the t- on, on, on this show as well, but you, you, you put a great deal of import on explosives as well and the ability to not just have to dink and dunk, but chunk plays being a big part of your offense. Fair to say? Absolutely. I mean, if you watch, if you watch college football, it's, in any football, it's, it's really, really hard to move the football methodically down the field without making a mistake at some point or even not even making a, st- a mistake. The other guys on the other side of the line of scrimmage are on scholarship too, <laughs> and they have coaches who are trying to keep us from doing what we intend to do. And so at some point, they'll typically just make a play. If you if you watch the offenses, typically speaking, who are scoring a lot of points, they're making big plays. And, and maybe not on every drive, but on at least some of their drives. And when all of your drives have to be um, methodical in nature, 
um, it's going to be hard to score enough points to win in this in this day and age. Okay. Uh, break time on the coordinator's corner. When we come back, we'll have more with offensive coordinator Jeff Grimes. If you have questions for Coach Grimes, you can submit them using hashtag CCBYU. This is the coordinator's corner brought to you by JCWs on BYU TV and BYU Radio. I would like to congratulate the men's basketball team on their big win this weekend. I know that one of them is here. I want you to stand up. Stand up. It's not me. I'm not on the team. Then how do you explain this? I bought it. He's on the team. Come on, Jake. There's no need to be humble. I'm, I'm not on the team. No midterm if he makes this shot, if he misses extra homework. Jake, 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 Jake. Gear so legit, they'll think you're on the team. BYU Store. Discover something new this week with BYU TV. Tonight at 7 Mountain, it's an all-new episode of Studio C. Have a delightful evening with the family as you sit back with the pack and enjoy a good laugh. Then, tomorrow at 5 Mountain, get the latest updates and analysis of BYU football with host Dave McCann on a new episode of After Further Review. Watch your favorite BYU TV shows here and catch up anytime on BYUtv.org or the BYU TV app. Some say if you're looking for the soul of America, you'll find it right here in Memphis, Tennessee. But if Memphis is the soul of America, then what's the soul of Memphis? From the banks of the Mississippi to the neon lights of Beale Street, that soul's hiding somewhere, and I've got to put it all in one painting. Join me as we paint the town of Memphis, Tennessee. Don't miss Painting the Town tomorrow at 830 Mountain on BYU TV. Well, the premise of the show is kids and parents match up answers. And then the all-important uh, bake-off, which is when the kids bake up a real tasty treat <laughs> that includes some normal items and then some very strange items like uh, seafood and hot spicy things. Sure. And whoever has the most points comes over and spins the prize wheel back there. I think what's going to happen is they're going to be inspired to play it at home. They're going to be like, hey, Dad, what am I thinking? What's my answer to this question? You try to match it. Or Mom, you try to match this or vice versa. EDU Today. Welcome back to the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. BYU Offensive Coordinator Jeff Grimes with me until the top of the hour. 3-3, three and three, BYU hosting 6-1 and one Hawaii on Saturday night. So six wins normally means a bowl eligibility, but as Hawaii plays 13 regular season games, have to put themselves at seven wins to get that eligibility. They have their first shot at that on Saturday, uh, visiting BYU. And uh, Coach Kalani talks so much about protecting Lavelle's house. It's a big thing for you guys. And uh, and certainly it's one of those nights Saturday to kind of uh, bow up, no pun intended, and uh, and get back on the winning track here at home and uh, put you guys one more step toward postseason eligibility, one of the goals you guys have set before the year, certainly. Yeah, um, and the bottom line for us as an offense is we just we just need to play better. Um, and, and it doesn't matter necessarily who we're playing. Um, we just we need to execute better. And um, there have been times this season where we've done that, and then there have been times when we haven't. And um, I think our focus this week is going to be a little bit more on us than it is our opponent. Uh, one of the positives from Saturday night to come uh, out of the Utah State game, in fact, it's been a positive this season, is when BYU gets chances to score touchdowns in scoring territory, they're doing this, doing so at a much greater rate than last year. You were 3-for-3 three three with red zone touchdowns on Saturday night. And among those touchdowns were two uh, to guys who weren't playing for BYU last year, in uh, Gunnar Romney and Dylan Colley, and for that matter, Lupini Katoa, who wasn't active last year, scored again. So it's coming from newer people. And I thought that Gunnar and Dylan would be a big part of your pass attack, as I'm sure you did as well. Good to see them get in the end zone Saturday or Friday. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when you get when you get new players on your team, um, you you often hope for the best from them right away. And sometimes it takes a little bit longer for them to get going than you might have anticipated, particularly with a guy like Gunner, who's who's a freshman and um, didn't have a full camp for you either, did he? Didn't was injured almost all of camp, and so I think he's just starting to hit his stride. Uh, speaking of injury, unfortunately, uh, Squally Canada has been giving it a go, but I'm not sure when his last truly healthy game was. And it seems like uh, game to game, he's just uh, either you know getting dinged or finding he can't go 100. percent Where is he kind of right now with you on a health standpoint? And what's reasonable to expect from him uh, moving forward? Yeah, I don't know. I would say he's questionable right now, um, 
And it's one of those unfortunate things about the game. Um, but he certainly has not been himself for the past three weeks. And um, we just need to get him healthy and, and uh, see him back to where he was earlier this season. Riley Burton may have gotten in the game Friday. If he did, it escaped my attention. Did he get any reps for you against Utah State? A little bit. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, he didn't have any carries, though, right, did he, for no. you? Uh, uh, where is he with you in terms of your group? Uh, is he part of the mix, part of the active mix at running back right now? He's part of the mix, and, and with Squally being out at this moment anyway, and, and again, I don't know where he'll what his status will be for Saturday, but at this moment, he's one of the guys who's competing to be the next guy in the game or the guy in the game alongside Peeney when when uh, we have two tailbacks on the field at the same time. And Cato is another guy that I don't maybe you don't necessarily think as as a young guy, but he truly is. He's he's a freshman playing his first football with BYU after a mission. And uh, how's he coming along through six games as a collegian? He's kind of your guy right now, your lead man. Yeah, he he is he has grown a great deal both as a as a person and as a player and I think he had to work through earlier this season um, what it's like to be a college football player. We've got a lot of, of freshmen playing right now, whether that be true freshmen or redshirt freshmen. If you just look across the board at all the guys who are playing for us right now, there are a lot of young guys out there, and that's that's no excuse. But those guys have to learn um, what it's like to be a college student athlete. And one of the things I'm most pleased with from – Lopini is his uh, his maturity and his his growth in that regard and the abil- ability to uh, manage the strain of being a college football player and and being a student at the same time. Which kind of brings about a bigger picture question right now, and and you 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 allude to it, and we're going to mention a number of guys uh, who've been a big part of the offense this year that are are freshmen or redshirt freshmen: Dax Milne, Dallin Holker, Brady Christensen, Keanu Saliaponga, uh, James Empey. Tristan Hodge is a sophomore, but is seeing his first action at BYU. Uh, Gunnar Romney, uh, just to name a handful of guys up top. And then you throw Lopini Katoa in the backfield. Zach Wilson at quarterback. That's a number of guys you've had touch the ball or be a big part of your team that are just very, very young. So in that sense, the future is bright for your offense, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. I think um, so. There are two things there. When you say you're playing with that many freshmen, which is most of our offense, um, that is a, a positive because that says that you've got some young guys who are some of your best players. The negative is those guys tend to make mistakes, and they often at times hit a wall at some point during the season uh, just with all the um, the mental and emotional and physical strain that a college football season brings about, which is something different than what they've experienced before, even those who may have redshirted. It's different when you're playing. Um, and so – we got to help some of those guys get through that. Does it also hint at a, a bit of a trough in terms of what you need your personnel depth to be uh, moving forward right now? Yeah, yeah, we we don't have enough of that. We don't have enough guys who are we don't have enough guys who are contributing effectively at this point. Okay, uh, you hit third down a, a little bit earlier. Uh, what's a reasonable number for you in your first year as a coordinator? Do you set a benchmark goal that we want to be here on third downs? Um, and, and what's going to be maybe the key, if there is one, to getting it where you'd like it to be? Well, the key is to not be in third and long a whole lot. Your odds obviously decrease significantly the, the more yardage you have to gain. And for us, we need to put ourselves in third and manageable. We need to be in third and two, third and four, third and six, rather than third and eight, third and ten, third and twelve. Um, I think that's that's the most important thing. And then the second thing is when we are faced with those longer opportunities, we just have to throw and catch better. Uh, on the throwing and catching better part, uh, there, it seemed like there were more drops than normal on, on Friday night. And after a while, it, it almost became kind of an epidemic where one begat another begat another, where it was just more open, more open. How did you look at it from a receiver standpoint? Uh, do they know that they had a rough night and that no one needed to tell them that they had drops? Yeah, I don't think anybody needs to tell them, although I typically do. Um, early early in the game, um, I didn't think that was the case as much as it was later in the game. And um, it was it, it, in any of the games um, in which we've – Uh, not caught the ball well it hasn't necessarily just been one guy it's been a number of guys which says um, we're either playing the wrong guys or we've got to coach them better how much of that is a competition in season uh, where you earn your playing time from your last game and or your last practice does that factor into it I think the fact that we've played a number of different guys at different positions this year again whether that be left guard tight end 
receiver um, or or tailback. Um, any of those positions are up for, uh, for competition, and you'll continue to see that from us. Okay, last thing for you. At 3-3, three and three, the sky is not falling. You can get to where you want to go this season, and it's important that people maybe not lose sight of that. Absolutely. When, when I took this job, I knew that it would be a process. I think maybe we um, exceeded expectations early, um, but we still have half a season in front of us, and I am certainly excited for the challenge and believe that we're going to finish the season the right way. We'll see you after the bye week. All right, bye week coming up after Hawaii, and Hawaii is on Saturday. I'm Greg Rubel. This has been the Coordinator's Corner. We'll talk to you next week at 1 o'clock Eastern, 11 a.m. Mountain. So long from BYU TV and BYU Radio. I ain't got no chill. The BYU TV Sports Countdown to Kickoff. BYU versus Hawaii. 9 Eastern, 7 Mountain, Saturday. Lower. I'm gonna let it shine. Just let it light up.